OK, so first of all. Last week uh, we talked about this set of questions on page 30 about the yoga. Um, and we missed a few mistakes, so I went back to check and I realized that. Uh, they are actually significant enough to discuss in class. So there are four that we did not catch last time. Two of them have to do with the word only. The first sentence, if you only learn one yoga posture. The idea is only one. So you should put the only before the one. If you learn only one yoga posture. Later on, we have another use of the word only here. Only breathing two or three times. Again, the idea is only two or three times, so this one should be breathing only two or three times. Now, the other two mistakes are actually related to something that we will only discuss. Sorry, that we will discuss only next semester. But I want to give you the correct sentence now. Uh, OK, so. Here. It says to form the greeting turtle posture. The mat should extend from knees to armpits. We we corrected this part, right? This is supposed to be describing the mat. The other problem is. The first half of the sentence to form the posture is not a complete sentence, but it is implying a subject. The subject is you, right? If you want to form this posture. The implied subject should be the subject of the complete part of the sentence. So after this comma, the mat is the subject, should extend is the verb, and then the rest is uh, finishing the sentence. So in this part, the subject should match the implied subject you. So we need we need to change the subject from the mat to you. You should extend the mat, etc. And the last mistake is the same logic here. While bending the right knee up to the nose, again, there's no subject, but the implied subject is you, while you are bending the right knee up to the nose. But the complete part of the sentence uh, begins with the subject, the ankle. Right, the left ankle is the subject. Relaxes is the verb. Uh, and. The verb relax here does not take an object. So we need to change this subject to you so that it, it matches the first half of the sentence. So this should be uh, while bending the right knee up to the nose. You. Should. Relax. Uh, the left ankle. So in you, uh, we are also turning the word relax into a transitive verb. Now it takes an object. So those are the four that we missed last time. OK, let's look at the homework prepositions. Number one, it already gives you consists of means um, it is made up of. Uh, so if, if you use the verb consist of, the subject is bigger and the object is smaller and the object goes into the subject. Number two, I'm uncomfortable because that man is staring at me. Remember, if you use to, the other person is supposed to uh, like receive the signal. There's supposed to be some kind of intention or communication. But if you use at, you don't really care what the other person does. 
So here to stare at means to look at. Disrespectfully, like you're looking at the other person like they are an object. So it is stare at. Number three, Ella hid the candy from the children. The idea is to take the candy away from the children and not let them see where it is. So you use from. Number four. I arrived in this country two weeks ago. Number five. We arrived at the airport 10 minutes late. The thing is for number four, you can also choose at, but it's not one of the choices. So between in and two, in is the better choice because a country is very big. You can be inside it, you can be outside it. Uh, number five, you could also use the word in, but it doesn't give you that choice. So between two and at, the better choice is at. At the airport, think of the airport as a location on the map. It's a point. You are there. So at the airport. Number six, I'm envious of people who can speak three or four languages fluently. Uh, envious just means jealous. Number seven, the students responded to the teacher's questions. So here we expect there to be some kind of communication. Right, the teacher asks the students respond, so it's communication. Therefore you use two. Number eight, the farmers are hoping for rain. This is kind of tricky because in some parts of the world, the dialect Fang Yin would also accept on hoping on uh, a more common phrase like this is to pray on rain, which just means to pray for rain. But the more standard answer is for. Number nine, I'm depending on you to finish this work for me. Depend, you can think of it as leaning on or like leaning against. There's oh, there's a an image of a physical action, right? You're like pressing on, you're leaning against. So it should be on. And it's definitely not in. There's no inside or outside uh, in this situation. Number 10, Tim wore sunglasses to protect his eyes from the sun, right? Away from the sun. You don't want to get hurt by the sun. Questions? All right, next one. Ooh, combinations. OK, they have been married to each other for 50 years. Number two, they have been always been faithful to each other. Number three, they are proud of their marriage. Number four, they are polite to one another. Number five, they are patient with each other. This is interesting. To be patient with someone means to be very tolerant, to humor them, to give them a lot of benefit of the doubt, to not rush them, to not hurry them. So it's not something you do to somebody. They are not the object of your actions. It's something you do with someone. When they are tired, when they are drunk, when they're being stupid, you sit with them and you work through it with them. So we say to be patient with somebody. Number six, they are devoted to one another. One another just means each other. It's the same idea. And number seven, they have been committed to their marriage. Questions? Please let me know if I'm going too fast.
or if I'm going too slow, I can go faster. OK, next one. Oh, she's a building building. OK. Uh, number one, they are often annoyed at each other's behavior. In this situation, uh, you don't really care how, what the other person thinks, how the other person responds. The idea is that they are doing something annoying. You are being annoyed by them. So your feeling is you are annoyed at them. They argue with each other every day. An argument is goes in both directions, right? So you can't say argue. If you say argue to someone, that means you are presenting an argument, lun dian, and telling someone else. But it does not mean that you are fighting. Here it means that they're fighting, and fighting goes in two directions. So it's argue with someone. They are bored of their relationship. They are tired of one another. Jacob is jealous of Emily's friends. This is the same as envious. Same grammar. And number six, Emily is sometimes frightened of Jacob's moods. You can also say frightened by. The two choices mean slightly different things. Frightened by is more active. In this case, therefore, it is more dangerous. When Jacob gets into a specific mood, you are afraid that he might hit you or he might hurt himself. In that case, you would say frightened by. But if it's simply a general scary situation, you would say frightened of. Questions? OK, next one, page 33. Match A uh, with B, OK, so. Column A, my boots are made of leather. OK, so it gives you the second half of the sentence as a kind of hint. Number two, we hope you succeed. The best one is E, in winning the scholarship. Um, the best answer would use at, succeed at winning the scholarship, but it doesn't give you this choice. So the second best answer is in. Number three, she forgave him for telling a lie. B, forgive somebody for some problem. A for here meaning uh, it's giving you the reason. Number four, I'm going to take care of the children tonight. To take care of. Uh, so F. Instead of take care of, you can also say care for without take. So take care of means to care for. Number five, the firefighters rescued many people. A, from the burning building. So the idea is they entered the burning building and they carried people out. So they took them from the burning building. Number six. I pray for peace. The reason you pray is you want peace, so you pray for peace, G. Number seven, trucks are prohibited from entering the tunnel. So the idea is uh, you are taking trucks away from entering the tunnel. You're not letting them enter the tunnel, D. Questions? OK, next one. Uh, Andrea 
contributed her ideas to the discussion. So it's contribute to. Number two. Is Ballas substituted for our regular teacher? The sentence pattern here is to substitute or replace A for B. A is the new thing, B is the old thing. Now, you can also flip this around. You can say B with A. Again, A is the new thing, B is the old thing. So A for B is uh, first the new thing, then the old thing. Or you can say substitute B with A is to replace the old thing B using the new thing A. Number three, I can't distinguish one twin from the other to distinguish A from B or to tell A from B or to tell A and B apart. Or, you know, differentiate A from B, all of the same words. Number four, children rely on their parents for food and shelter. This is the same as depend, right? Depend on, rely on, lean on. Number five, I'm worried about this problem. In the passive voice, Bei Dong Yuqi, right? Am worried, it's passive. You can only use about or uh, you can always use by, but in this case, you can also use about. But in the active voice, you can say about or you can say over in the active voice. Number six, I don't care for spaghetti, which means you don't want spaghetti. I'd rather eat something else. Spaghetti is just the more formal name for pasta. Number seven, Charles doesn't seem to care about his bad grades. So this is the usual meaning of care, right? I don't care about something. Number eight, I'm afraid I don't agree with you. I'm afraid is just more polite. It doesn't mean anything special. Number nine, we decided on eight o'clock as the time we should meet. To decide on something means uh, the on presents the decision. Um, you can think about this as like a group of people are talking about something the choice is still up in the air, right? It has not yet been decided. So when it is decided, it falls onto the choice, right? So you decided on something. I'm not familiar with that author's works. I don't know it. Almost to come, I'm counting on you to be here. Again, same thing, right? Depend on, rely on, lean on, count on. These are all the same idea. The little girl is afraid of an imaginary bear that lives in her closet. So this is the same as frightened of or scared of. Questions? All right. Next page. Number one, we will fight for our rights. This is why we fight. Number two, who did you vote for in the last election? Number three, Jason was late because he wasn't aware of the time. 
He didn't know what time it was. Number four, I am grateful to you. For. Your assistance. For gives you the reason, so I'm grateful because of your assistance, and so I am giving my gratitude to you. I'm grateful to you. Number five. Elena is not content with. The progress she is making. So here it's the same as to be satisfied with. Number six, Paul's comments were not relevant to the topic under discussion. Oh, it gives you another one, right? Under discussion. When you discuss something, the thing is under discussion. Number seven, have you decided? Which one should this be? Decided. On. Right, we just saw this to decide on something. Have you decided on a date for your wedding yet? Number eight, Patricia applied for admission to the university. So the reason she applied is she wants to get admission. She wants to enter. Where does she apply? She sends things. Uh, she sends her application to the university. So apply for admission to the university. Number nine, Daniel dreamed of. Some of his childhood friends last night. And Mr Miyagi dreams of. Oh, wait, hold on. OK, I see why it's asking these two. If it's an actual dream, if you are asleep in bed at night and there is a real dream, you can also say about. I think both are fine. But if it's not an like if it's not falling asleep dream, it's something that you really want in your life, that kind of dream, then it should be of. That's not right either. You know what? I think I think you can use both for both. There's no real difference. Maybe there used to be. There's no difference today. Number 11, the accused woman was innocent of the crime with which she was charged. So it gives you another one. To be charged with a crime means that the government accuses you of committing a crime. Right? To be charged with. Number 12, Ms. Sanders is friendly. You can say to everyone or you can say with everyone. It depends on what kind of picture you have in your mind. If she's friendly to everyone, that means like every morning, whenever she passes by somebody, she always says hello. She always greets familiar people by their name. It's always from Ms. Sanders to the other people. But if you say friendly with everyone, that means whenever somebody talks with her, she's always very polite. She's always very kind. Every interaction, she's always friendly. So it's in two directions with. So depending on which picture you have in your mind, both of these are fine. Number 13, the secretary provided me with. A great deal of information. So similar words, right? Um, supplied. And you can even use gifted as um, a verb to give as a gift. All of these are with. Um, provide with, supply with, gift with. Number 14, Ivan compared the wedding customs in his country to those in the United States. Another possible answer is with. Again, the difference is, is it going in one direction or is it going in two directions? Is Ivan saying? Um, is he only thinking about? 
like, oh, the different the ways that they are different? Or is he also thinking about the ways that they are same? Questions? OK, um, if you have a lot of wrong answers, don't worry. This is also a way to learn about these words and the prepositions that you should use with them. So don't think about it as making mistakes. Think about it as learning while doing. OK, so that's the homework. Today we are going to talk about. Um, punctuation and typing. Punctuation. So there are a few things. Well, there's I think there's one important idea you should know about English. Two important ideas you should know about English punctuation. The first very important idea, especially for Chinese speakers, is that in English there is only one kind of comma. In Chinese, we have two commas. We have the regular comma, dou hao, and we have the series comma, dun hao. English does not have the series comma. When you make a list of things, just use a regular comma. The other main idea is that in English, punctuation marks almost always are treated as just another letter. They are not a separate word. So in Chinese, a punctuation mark takes up the same amount of space as any other Chinese character. Right, if you're writing them in in blocks, then a punctuation mark takes up its own space in the block. Right, but in English, that is not true. If you look at the subtitles, even the commas and the periods do not take up their own space, they are added to the end of the previous word as just another letter. For example, at the end of this sentence, there is a period to tell us that the sentence has ended. The period does not have its own space. It is connected to the previous word as just another letter. Therefore, if you put the punctuation too far from the previous word, it is wrong. If you don't separate it from the next word, it is also wrong. It is another letter that follows the previous word. Oh, OK, so like sometimes when I'm reading things that uh, students write, sometimes the comma will be too far on the right. Sometimes it will be in the middle between two words. Those are all wrong. And those are all mistakes that. Uh, a native speaker or even a European speaker of English would not make. Because in languages that use an alphabet, the punctuation always is connected to the previous word as another letter and never its own independent symbol. That kind of mistake is only made by Asian people. OK, so those are the two key ideas. If those are the only two ideas you remember from this week, I will have succeeded as your grammar teacher. Uh, but we should still talk about the rest of the English punctuation marks. Let's start from the easy ones. Period. In British English, they call this the full stop. Uh, this is British English. So if a Brit talks about a full stop, now you know what they're talking about. It is used in two places to end a sentence. 
or to abbreviate a word, to shorten a word. Um, but if you're using an acronym, like NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, then you don't need the period. You used to need the period. In the old days, the teacher would tell you, please write US like this. But today we, we don't care. You can just combine it into one word. So that's the period. Um, OK, next is the question mark. And. Well, no, let's start with the question mark. Question marks tell the reader that this has been a question. Even if the sentence order has not changed, if it ends with a question mark, it tells the reader that this sentence is not sh sure. The, the information is not entirely accurate, maybe. Um, so traditionally, you have to change the sentence, right? I got the job would become, did I get the job? The sentence changes, and we will talk about this next semester. But now, in the age of the internet, you will also sometimes, you will mostly see this, actually. Same sentence ending with a question mark. In this case, it is still a question, and it, it means, is this true? Did this really happen? I can't believe it. Now, the other thing about the question mark is that it does not have to be the end of a sentence. In this case, or is not the second sentence. It is the second half of the first sentence. The same rules go for the exclamation point. The exclamation point uh, used to be used to convey excitement. You know, wow, amazing, interesting, fascinating, congratulations. Today, it is also used to convey sincerity. It's something that you truly feel and you truly mean. So if you say, I'm happy to hear that, exclamation point, this means you're being serious. But if you say, I'm happy to hear that, period, that means that you are really, really angry because you don't have the sincere exclamation point. And also, uh, it does not have to be the end of, of the sentence. OK, next. Parentheses. Parentheses are used to give extra information. They come in pairs. If you use one, you have to use the other one. Now, punctuation marks that come in pairs also have a special rule. This one still comes at the end of the word. It's part of the word too. But the first one comes before the first word in this section. It's part of the word and. So if you put your parentheses here, this is wrong. It, uh, it, I say that it, it puts together what's inside the parentheses. Uh, same for the quotation marks in Ha. Right, so this is something that he said. It is an exact quotation. In English, we can only use quotation marks in two situ uh, three situations. 
exact quotation. This is exactly what he said. The exact same words, the exact same order. Nothing is changed. Then you should add quotation marks. And again, they uh, tuck in the middle part. So this quotation mark is part of the word job. And this quotation mark is part of the word I. The second way we use quotation marks is for irony. Oh, sorry, let me let me stick with this one first. Uh, there's one more thing to know about quotation marks as a uh, quotation. If you are introducing it with this, right? Somebody said something. This comma has to be here. This comma separates the quotation from the tag, biaoqian, the information about who said it. If the person comes first, he said, and then comma, space, first quotation mark, the quotation, second quotation mark. In American English, the period always comes inside the quotation mark. In British English, it depends. In British English, it only goes inside the quotation mark if it is part of the whole set. If, if this is a complete sentence. Although, in fact, British people are quite lazy with their punctuation and they will always put it outside the quotation mark, uh, even if it's not supposed to be there. But American English always puts it inside. If your speaker tag comes at the end of a sentence, this is lowercase because it's still the same sentence, but also the sentence does not end here. So you should change this period to a comma. Again, if you're using British English, the comma goes outside the quotation mark. So that's the first use of quotation marks. The second use of quotation marks is for irony. So for example, uh, another way to say this is a special use of language, a special meaning. So if you say I quote got the job like this, that probably means this is not a good thing. Getting a job is usually a good news. But if you put it in quotation marks, that means you are uh, talking about this in a special way. If it's special, it's probably not good. So this situation might be. You need a job. Or else you're going to starve to death. So you apply to everything. But the only job that you get is something that you don't want to do. So you do have to do the job, but you're not happy about it. So you might tell your friend, I quote, got the job. It's irony. Uh, and then the third place we use quotation marks is for the title of shorter works. Uh, like stories or songs. So for example, the song You Belong With Me is a song on a Taylor Swift album. The album name would not be in quotation marks. It would be treated in a different way. We're going to talk about that later. But the song is a short work inside a longer work. So for short works, we use quotation marks. So single songs, uh, short stories, poems, short poems, shorter works, that can fit inside longer works, we use quotation marks. Now you'll notice that I've been using double quotation marks. English also sometimes uses single quotation marks. We use single, single quotation marks when they appear inside double quotation marks. So if you're saying that your friend said he, quote, got the job that he didn't want, you would write it like this. The original sentence is, I got the job. 
but this whole sentence is a quotation said by this person. So you have quotation marks inside quotation marks. In that case, the inside quotation marks are single quotation. The outside quotation marks are double quotation. And if you need to put quotation marks inside the single quotation marks, you go back to double. So if you're being especially ironic about this job, like maybe the job is getting coffee for your boss, not a real job, uh, then you would put uh, inside single quotation marks, you would go back to double quotation marks. If you need to add parentheses inside parentheses, you use brackets. If you need to add parentheses inside brackets, you should rewrite the sentence. It shouldn't be that confusing. OK, uh, I think we have. Four or five punctuation marks left. OK, so. Um, next is the colon. This one. A colon is used to explain things. I'm not happy about the new job, colon. I didn't really want it. This colon means because. Uh, and like most other English punctuation marks, it is added to the previous word. It is part of the word job. Now, if the sentence after the colon is a complete sentence, you can start it with a capital letter. Most people don't know this. Most people think anything after a colon should be. It's part of the previous sentence, so it should be in lowercase. But in fact, if this is a complete sentence, it can start with a capital letter. Both are fine. OK, now we're starting to get into some of the harder stuff. If in a, I just said that for a quotation, the words have to be exactly the same as the person said them, right? But if you need to change the quotation, you need to tell the reader that you are changing the quotation, that this is not exactly what the person said. If you need to take something out of the quotation, use what we call an ellipsis, sorry, ellipsis, and in English it is period, space, period, space, period. So in this case, maybe the original quotation was, I got the bad job. That's not supposed to bring a dash in. Got the bad job. So in this case, you are changing the quotation. You took out the word bad. So you have to tell the reader there used to be something here, but you took it out. If you need to add something. Let's say the original quotation is I got the job and you want to add the word bad to explain to the reader. The attitude about getting this job, you have to put the added thing in brackets. Not parentheses, brackets. So this tells the reader that you added something here. That the this is the original quotation and you added the word bad.
OK, next let's talk about the. Semicolon. Fun hall. For some reason, native speakers do not know how to use the semicolon. If you go ask 10 native speakers, how do you use the semicolon? Eight people will say, fuck, I don't know. Two people will tell you a reason, a, a way to use it, and those two people will be wrong. The semicolon is the same as a period, except the sentence before it and the sentence after it are connected in some way. These are two complete sentences. I was happy, complete. She was not. Uh, we have omitted the word happy. I should say now that you know how to use brackets, you should type it like this. We have omitted the word happy. But these two things are connected if they are about the same thing. Therefore, even though there are two complete sentences to show that they are connected, you can use a semicolon. The there are two ways to use the semicolon. This is the first way. Uh, and in fact, you will see this uh, in sentences that have a transition word. Actually, we can just use this sentence. For example, however, she was not. If you want to make this one sentence, this should be a semicolon. Or other words like however, such as moreover, also fits into this pattern. Or otherwise, you start to understand the kind of word that I'm talking about, right? However, therefore, otherwise, moreover, in addition, conversely, all of these kinds of words fit into this pattern. They are preceded by a semicolon following the previous word, and they are followed by a comma. So this is the first way of using semicolons. The second way of using semicolons is when you have a list of things and some items on that list are uh, have commas. So. Um, I sent letters to. Paris, France. Paris, Texas and Paris. Ontario. These are three places that have a city called Paris. So you need to tell the reader which Paris are you talking about? So Paris, France, you would write it like this. But if all of these were also commas, it would be very, very confusing. So to separate items that already include commas, you change the serial comma into a serial semicolon. OK, so if you're making a list and your list includes items that already have commas, then you change the instead of using commas to separate the items, you would change those commas into semicolons to separate the items. So this is one item. This is another item. And this is the third item. And they are separated by semicolons because each item already has a comma. OK, when we come back, I will talk about the comma, the hyphen, the dash and the. Uh, there are two kinds of dashes, so let's take a short break.
Okay, commas. Commas are a bit more complicated because there are many different ways to use commas, but there are rules and the rules are clear. It's just there are a lot of rules. So at least this is one place in English grammar where there are very few exceptions. So the comma. The first place to use the comma is when the sentence is out of order. I mentioned this in the first week. The typical English sentence order is subject, verb. Oh, that's a bad sentence, sorry. Subject, verb, object, and then all the other details. So if you move all the other details to the front, you have to use a comma to tell the reader that the sentence order has changed. That would, would be this comma. Um, so this is the same comma that is used here. The second place to use commas is in making a list. Item one, comma, item two, comma, and item three. Some people will say you should not add this comma, but in American English, it is more common to add it than to take it away. The opposite for British English. In British English, it is more common not to use this comma. Uh, it has an it's it's so famous that it has a name. This is called the Oxford comma. Uh, or the serial comma. The next place to use a comma is when you are giving unessential information. This information is not necessary, but it adds context. It's useful to tell the reader or something. So uh, a speech tag is this kind of comma. This comma before the he said. It's not necessary to say who said the, the uh, quote. The quote itself is the important thing. So we use a comma to separate the important quote from the unimportant speaker information. Uh, you can also use a comma like a parenthesis. Uh, yeah, let's let's delete this now. Well, first of all, if you end the sentence with two, it is always preceded by a comma. Two is always not important. Um, but in this case, if you think this is not essential information, you can use a comma to separate it from the essential information. Um, so if you think that I guess is also not important, you can separate it using commas as well. So the logic is really the same as the parentheses. And then finally is what we call the a positive comma, yu. A positive means that the two are the same. So the two nouns before and after this comma, my brother, Ken, these are the same people. These two are the same person. So this is not essential information. We already know this person is my brother. The name really is not essential to the grammar. Um, and so it, a positive commas are considered a kind of supplemental information. And therefore, you can separate it from the rest of the sentence 
using two commas. So the sentence would be, this is my brother behind me. But if you want to add that extra information, you can use two commas to tell the reader, this is not essential information, but I want you to know anyway. So these are the rules for using commas. And there are, as we mentioned, there are three basic rules, right? Making a list, a different sentence order, or adding extra information. Things can get complicated when all three rules are used at the same time. So in this sentence, all three rules are being used. First, the sentence order is not the typical order, right? This should come at the end. But because the end of the sentence has so much information, we move this to the beginning and we use a comma to tell the reader we know this is not the usual sentence order. Then we have a list. I did three things. Number one, I drove my car. Number two, I rode my bike. And number three, I ran. So these commas are to tell you that this is a list of things. Finally, this is extra information. The point, my, my emphasis is that I did these three things, but I also want you to know why. The reason is in order to reach my brother. And then I tell you my brother's name, which is also not important. Ken. Okay, questions about commas? OK, we have three more punctuation marks. And I made a PowerPoint for this. Hyphens and dashes. Hyphen in Chinese, lian jie hao. It connects two words into one word. Eagle-eyed, ying yin, pre-war, zan qian. These are two words or two parts of a word that are connected by a hyphen into one word. So when you say something like, a three-year-old kid. Then you have to use hyphens because three-year-old is one word. Right, these are three words that you put together to make one word, and it is connected by hyphens. Related to hyphens are uh, m dash. It's called an M dash because originally on the typewriter, it was as long as the letter M. It is used to interrupt the sentence. For example, the camera captures everything, and why shouldn't it? The second half of the sentence does not really fit into the grammar of the first half of the sentence, so we use the M dash to interrupt the sentence, or we can say to break the sentence. And that's why in Chinese we call this po zi hao, because you're breaking the grammar. You can use two M dashes in the same logic as a parentheses. So, my brother Ken is behind you holding a knife. Um, so if you think that this information is just very not important, you can use parentheses. It's kind of like the reader knows the name of your brother, you're just reminding them. If you think this information is very important, you can use two M dashes to interrupt the sentence and to emphasize this extra information. But if you think it's not very important, but the reader should still know, you would use two parentheses 
this is between, sorry, two commas. This is between the parentheses and the m dashes. So this is zhong den chang du, you yong liang ge dou dian. Now you will notice something strange about the m dash. It is its own word. It does not go with the previous word. It does not go with the next word. It is placed exactly in the middle and it connects two words. This is American English. In British English, they use the N dash. I don't know if you can tell the difference. The N dash is slightly shorter than the M dash. And it's called an N dash because on the original typewriter, it is the same length as the letter N. British English does not use the M dash. It uses the N dash uh, and it uses it. I need Microsoft Word for this. No. Oh, here. So in American English, you would use the M dash to break apart, to interrupt the sentence. But in British English, they use the N dash like this. There is a space before and after the N dash when it is used to break a sentence. This is in British English. But in both kinds of English, you would also In both kinds of English, you would also use an N dash to show a range from page 51 to page 77. From year 2020 to year 2023, the N dash shows a range. Fanway. And if you are connecting two words like the hyphen, but one of these words already has two words. Right, civil war. Sorry, civil war. Eh. Civil war is one word. It has two parts, but it's one word. Neizan. When you add civil onto war, it changes the meaning of the word. It's not just a war; it's a civil war. So, if you need to add something to this word using a hyphen. That hyphen becomes an N dash. Right? Pre war, because war is one word, uses a hyphen. But pre civil war, because civil war is two words, uses an N dash. And uh, let's see. Right, so if th this is to say in Chinese, we would use an, an M dash like this, right, to introduce information. But in English, this would be the appositive comma or two M dashes. You would not only use one set of M dashes in English, only in Chinese. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about dashes. Uh, you will have the chance to learn about them again next year during English Composition four, English is what's okay, and those are the punctuation marks. Questions? Oh, I should also show you this. Um, actually, no, uh, okay, so if you don't have questions, and uh, now I want to give you some very quick practice. This is the correct sentence. I'm now going to show you some incorrect sentences and ask you why are they wrong? Ready? Where is the mistake?
right? There has to be a comma between the quotation and the speech tag. Next one. Where's the mistake? Do you see it? Here. The punctuation mark must follow the previous word. Next one. Where's the mistake? Here. You should use a double quotation mark, not two single quotation marks. These are two different things. Right, look, look at this one. These two are very close together. And then look at this one. These two are not the same. This is two symbols. This is two single quotation marks. This is one double quotation mark. It looks different. Next one. Where's the mistake? Here. The quotation marks and apostrophes are not supposed to be straight. Right? Did you see the change in direction? This is too straight. We want it to curve. Right? Now it's curving this direction. Next one. Where's the mistake? Here. This is supposed to be the same sentence. If you write it like this, this is two sentences. But you're, the second part is talking about the first part. They are one sentence. Next one. Where's the mistake? Yes. Yes, very good. Here it is. There was an extra space. Right? It's too far apart. There are two spaces. You only need one space. OK. Again, where is the mistake? Do you see it? Yes, here it is. Again, an extra space. The ending quotation mark is part of the previous word. It is not an independent symbol. There should not be a space here. OK, that's it. Great, so now you know the uh, difficulty of finding these kinds of mistakes. Next, I want to talk about typing. If I can find the slide. Uh, oh, here we go. OK. This is a keyboard. These are the keys that you should know. Um, OK, so parentheses are here, right? Nine and zero. But brackets are here. It's on Guahao Desiri. If you need large brackets, hold shift and then type this and it will give you large brackets. But in English, we don't need large brackets. We only need middle brackets or small brackets, I guess. If you need a quotation mark, they are here. If you need a single quotation mark, 
just type once. If you need a double quotation mark, hold shift. And then type. Don't type two of these. Right, hold shift and type once. Uh, now you might be thinking, OK, how do I change the direction of my quotation marks? Microsoft Word and Google Docs will change the direction for you. If you type a quotation mark at the beginning of a word, it will change the direction to match the word. If you type it at the end of a word, it will change the direction to match the word again. So that part is automatic. Uh, if you need to type a hyphen, you can type it here or here. Uh, this is technically a minus sign, Jian Hao, but it's the same. It's the same thing. If you hold shift and type this key, it will give you an underscore di xin, but it will be an empty underscore. It's not a hua di xin, it's a hong bai di xin. Now. From your writing class, you should know that at the beginning of every paragraph, you should indent. Please do not hit the space bar. Please hit tab. Tab is used to indent your um, words, your paragraphs. Uh, actually, yeah, let me let me show you. Yeah. OK, cool. So. If you type space, it just does this. It's a very small. Um, wait, what am I doing? It's a very small difference, right? But if you hit tab, that gives you a correct indentation. Right, one key, that's it. And then finally, I also marked this key right here. This is technically called print screen system Re requisition. A request. If you type this key, the computer will actually let, let me let me do it right now. It will save the picture of your whole screen. Uh, and then you need to paste it somewhere. Like uh, actually we can use this. Paste. Ta da picture of the screen. Uh, if your computer is newer than this one, it will not directly save the screen. It will ask you, do you want to take a picture of the whole screen or part of the screen or what? Um, but remember, it, it only keeps it for you. It doesn't put it anywhere. It doesn't save the image. OK, uh, so those are the important keys that some people don't know, but that you should know about. Questions? OK, let's do some practice. Page 35, capitalization. In English, we use capital letters for proper nouns like names. The first word of every sentence. And in titles, the nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs in a title. So let's do these together, actually. Robert Jones is a name, so there are two capital letters. My uncle is not a name, so you don't need capital letters. But number three, this one might be a bit tricky. 
Uncle Joe is a name. Uncle is a title. And Aunt Sarah is also a name. Aunt is a title. It's like. Uh, yeah, so in this case, these two should be capitalized. For this reason. Uh, let's look at let's look at number four. I'd like you to meet my aunt. It's not a name and it's not a title. It's just a kind of person, so there's no change. Similarly, if you say I want you to meet my mom, it's lowercase. But if you want to say I want you to meet mom. Then it's capitalized because mom is now a title or a name. The name of you call your mother mom. It's the title that you give her, so it should be capitalized. For the same reason. Um, if you use the word earth to mean soil, it is lowercase. But if you're talking about our planet, Earth is the name of the planet, so it should be capitalized. Number five, Susan W. Miller is a professor. It's a name, so Susan W. Miller. Also notice that this period is for abbreviation, so we don't need to always write out her full middle name. And then professor is a kind of job. So you don't need to capitalize it, but if you're using it as a title. You're calling her Professor Susan W. Miller, then it should have a capital P because it's a title and it's part of her name. Right, the next one. I am in Professor Miller's class. Again, this is short for professor. Number seven, the weather is cold in January. January is the name of the month, must be in capital letters. Number eight, the weather is cold in winter. Winter is one season, it is not a name. So don't have to be in capital letters. Number nine, Monday is the name of the week. Number 10, the city name is Los Angeles. Number 11, the state name is California. Right, so all of these names must be capitalized. But number 12, I like to visit large cities in foreign countries. There's no name here. Number 13, there are 50 states in the United States of America. The name of the country should be in capital letters, but 50 states, this is not part of the name. It is just a thing. So this should not be capitalized, only when it's part of the name. Number 14, it used to take weeks or months to cross an ocean. No names. Number 15. Today we can fly across the Atlantic Ocean. This is the name of the ocean. In hours. Number 16. I live on a busy street near the local high school. No names. Number 17. I live on Market Street. This is the name of the street. Here, Washington High School. This is the name of the school. Number 18, we stayed at a very comfortable hotel. No names. Number 19, we stayed at the Hilton Hotel. This is a name. In Bangkok, Bangkok is the name of the city, Mangku. You will notice that we do not capitalize the. 
in this case, in Bangkok, there is only one Hilton hotel, so we need to use a definite article, but it's not part of the name. So we don't capitalize the. And 20, Yoko is Japanese. Names of countries. Uh, OK, adjectives formed from names are also capitalized. So she can speak German. These are adjectives, but because they are formed from names, they are all capitalized. Questions? OK, page 36. Ooh, OK, these are kind of hard. OK, I'll give you three minutes. This part, the first half of page 36 is only about capital letters. Um, before you begin, this is also something you should know. I said that for the name of smaller or shorter works. We use quotation marks like the name of a song or the name of a story, but for the name of longer works. We use italics, xie ti. In Chinese, we have the arrows for book names, shu ming hao, but in English, book names are italicized, jia xie ti. Uh, this means this is a longer, complete work. OK, so uh, 10 mistakes regarding capital or lowercase letters. Three minutes. OK, let's compare answers. First mistake is in the title. Life. Of of is not a noun, verb, adjective or adverb of is a preposition, so it should be in lowercase. If you are ever given a book about ducks, no reason to make this uh, uh, capitalized. Take my advice and burn it. 
when I had to read Moby Duck, the teacher, again, you didn't mention a name, it's not a title, it's just a kind of person, promised me that it was good. She said that excitement was on every page. This is not a complete sentence because it begins with that. We'll talk about this next semester, but if a complete sentence begins with that, then it is used as a noun. This whole thing is the noun, the object of the word said. She said this, so excitement should be lowercase. I don't think so. A duckling with special powers is raised by his grandpa. Again, not a name. If it does not have the word grandpa, or sorry, if it does not have the word his, then grandpa becomes a name. But it said his grandpa, so it's just a kind of person. Moby actually goes to school and earns a doctorate or a PhD in bird science. After a really boring account of Moby's freshman year, the book turns to his career as a flight instructor. I was very happy to see him fly away at the end of the book. Okay, so that should be 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11? Oh, flight instructor counts as one. OK, so that's 10. Questions? OK, next page. I want to, uh, sorry, not next page, next half. I want to finish all of the questions today. Five commas that appear where they shouldn't and 10 spots that should have commas but don't. Let's do this together. So basically, there are a total of 15 comma mistakes. Well, well is an interjection. It doesn't have any meaning. So it's not part of the sentence. It is added to the sentence. It is not essential information. We separate it from the sentence with a comma. Well, Ms. Uh, Ms. Ehrlich, Because the point of the sentence is that time of year has arrived again. And the person is talking to Ms. Ehrlich. They are using her name to get her attention. In grammar, we call this the vocative tense. Uh, and it is also not important information. That time of year has arrived again. I must think about my strengths and weaknesses as an employee of Tow Ring International. First and most important, uh, I think it should be first comma and most important. So first gives you the order of information. It's not important. And most important is added information. This is also not important. Let me say that I love working for Toring. When I applied for the job, it begins with when. We'll talk about this next semester, but the sentence actually begins here. I never dreamed. So all of this part should come at the end of this sentence. Because it is here at the beginning, we tell the reader the order has changed by adding a comma to separate the two parts of the sentence. I never dreamed how much fun I would have taking two long lunches a day. Um, for adjectives, if they are the same kind of adjective, you can separate them using one comma. But these are two different kinds of adjectives. This one is how many, this one is how long. So you can just put them together without a comma. Sneaking out the back door is not my idea of fun. This is a gerund 
phrase, right? So this is the subject of the sentence. Is is the main verb. It is the same part of the sentence. You do not need a comma. Because no one ever watches what I am doing at toe ring. Comma. I. If it begins with because it is not a complete sentence. This is a reason it is not a sentence. Therefore, you should use a comma to set to tell the reader you moved this from the back of the sentence to the front of the sentence. Also. Ms Ehrlich. Again, the writer is calling her using her name. So it's not important. I confess that I do almost no work at all. Upon transferring to the plant in Idaho again, upon. Means that this is not a complete sentence, right? Preposition, gerund. Uh, preposition. Preposition object, preposition object. This is the subject. I is the subject. So before this is not a complete sentence, we use a comma to separate the two parts. I immediately claimed a privilege given only to the most experienced. Most skilled employees. So as I said, these are the same thing. Experienced and skilled are the same thing. So you need an, a positive comma here. Uh, and started to take two extra weeks of vacation. I have only one more thing to say. May I have a raise? OK, so that should be 15, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, OK, so it wants us to delete. This one. Skilled employees. This is on a positive comma. But the idea is essential to the sentence, so we don't need to separate skilled from the rest of the sentence using two commas. That's 15. Questions? OK, next page. Quotation marks. Uh, 10 places that need quotation marks. Let's do this together. This summer I went to Camp Waterberg, a waterbug, which was the setting for a famous poem by William Long titled. Poems, especially. Short poems go inside. Quotation marks. At Camp Waterbug, I learned to paddle a canoe without tipping it over more than twice a trip. My counselor even wrote an article about me in the camp newsletter, Waterbug Bites. This should be in italics. It's the name of a newsletter, so it's a longer work. The article was called Name of an article, a short story, a short report. How to tip a canoe is the name of this article. The counselor said, Rain Free is well named. This is the thing that the person said. I was not upset because I believed him eventually when he explained that the comment was an editing error. Are you sure? I asked him when I first read it. So usually you need a comma in this place, but we can 
skip the comma if there is another punctuation mark. Like a question mark or an exclamation point or a semicolon or anything else. Only when there is no other punctuation do you need to add the comma. You know. He responded quickly. That. I have a lot of respect for you. This is the speech tag. It is stuck in the middle of the sentence. Uh, and it explains the quotation, which is the rest of the sentence. Outside of the speech tag is the quotation. I nodded in agreement, but that night I placed a bunch of frogs under his sheets just in case he thought about writing how to. Uh, this is also the title of a potential article, right? Just in case he thought about writing this. So even the name of an article that is not yet written should be put in quotation marks. One of the frogs had a little label on his leg that read. Just kidding too. So this is quoting the label. So even if it's not a person, as long as the words are exactly the same, you should also put it in quotation marks. At the last campfire gathering, I sang a song from the musical Fiddler on the Roof. A musical in Rieju is a long work, so this should be in italics. Xieti. The song was called If I Were a Rich Man. Again, the name of the song. I changed the first line to. If I were a counselor, so here he is quoting or they are quoting part of the song. I won't quote the rest of the song because I'm still serving the detention my counselor gave me even though I'm back home now. OK, that should be 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Questions? OK, that is the end of the handout. We have finished the whole damn thing. Yay. Next week is the mock exam, Moni call. The results will not be part of your final grade. It is only for practice. Uh, and at the end of class next week, I will end the mock exam 10 minutes early and we will compare the answers together and we will go over the reason for each mistake. OK, so see you next week and good luck.